Welcome to episode 15 of the Hunt Backcountry podcast presented by Exo Mountain Gear. Two quick things, then we're going to dive straight into the show. First, Brian Rappel, you're this week's gear giveaway winner. Thanks for sending in some awesome questions on the topic that we're going to talk about tonight, and that is boots. If you want to enter to win weekly giveaways, all you have to do is send your questions or feedback to us at podcast at Exo Mountain Gear, or leave us a review on iTunes. Secondarily, you can find the notes for this show at exomountaingear.com forward slash 15, that is 1-5. Be sure to check out all the links, including the information about two sales that we're going to talk about in just a minute. All right, here's the show. The Hunt Pack Country Podcast is proudly brought to you by Exo Mountain Gear, makers of ultralight, ultra-tough packs that are designed to do what you love most, hunt the backcountry. Exo packs are designed for efficiency, simplicity, and durability that's backed by a lifetime warranty. To learn more about Exo Mountain Gear, please visit www.exomountaingear.com. Well, Steve James uh, from Lathrop and Sons, welcome to the podcast. How are you guys? We're doing good. Thanks for inviting us. Yeah, Thank you bet. You. And Steve, Glad to be part of it. Yeah, it's going to be fun. Steve, you're online as well. One thing... Um, it's kind of a random thing to start with. I mean, we don't try and make this podcast a commercial, but just based on the timing of it, wanted to let the listeners know about something right up front. So we're here just before Thanksgiving. This podcast is going to go live on the 25th, the day before Thanksgiving. And Steve James, I got an email from you guys today talking about your Black Friday and pre-Black Friday sales. So um, yeah. If guys are going to be shopping, go ahead and give us the spiel on the sale that you guys have running for listeners who it's, are catching this podcast right away. Sure, go ahead. It's, James. it's I, we kind of think it's a killer sale. Really, uh, we've got fifteen percent off straight across the board. Anything uh, on our website. Um, the only thing is the custom fitting. That's that we can't go ahead and do that because we really just don't know what is a. Would go into a custom fit. Well, a custom boot, custom boot system. It's too involved. By the time we'll get into that later in this podcast, but yeah, but yeah, it's that's cool. cool. Uh, so, is there a certain like discount code guys have to enter? Oh yeah, like that? gobble fit, gobble fifteen, baby, gobble fifteen. And then, how long does it run? Uh, we are running that until the thirtieth. Okay, perfect. So it starts the twenty fifth and runs to the thirtieth. Yep. All right. So- <laughs> Cool. So you listeners are catching the podcast right away. There's a good opportunity to save. And then Steve, I know that you're going to have something going on for EXO. So give us the scoop on when that's going on, how listeners could take advantage of it and how long that's going to run. Uh, yeah, we're just doing a free accessory of your choice, uh, Friday and Cyber Monday. So cool. um, jump on the website, order up the pack and uh, just put in the order notes what free accessory you'd like. Awesome. That's a good That's deal. a good one. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Well, let's get on to the meat and uh, let's all learn something here. First things first, um, Lathrop and Son, just kind of give us the the brief background on um, how the store came to evolve. And I mean, it's a pretty niche, interesting uh, piece of the market. How did it happen for you guys? I think it it took place actually having a phone conversation in my living room one time with the a gentleman asking me about going on a, a big bow hunt. And I said, you know, I just couldn't swing it. I wasn't going to be able to do it. And we started bouncing ideas around of some of the stuff that I had been doing for myself and James had been doing for himself, which was custom fitting our boots. And he said, I think that there's a real, there's a real market for that in, just hunters in general Mm -hmm. and you know we started doing that and then we just grew it one person at a time one person at a time and almost became kind of a fraternity it wasn't Lathrop and Sons was not built on a ton of a ton of advertising it was all built on just word of mouth yeah hard hardcore nose to the grinder really set with each person and feel their pain, figure out, have something in common. Yeah. You know, whether it's shooting a bow or shooting a rifle or, or 
hanging a tree stand in July in the heat or something. We have stuff in common with these guys. And um, then, uh, then doing that for 15 years in our podiatry background. My father's a podiatrist. And then both James and I carried a, a or, orthotic fabrication degrees in the um, podiatry practice for years. So we had a lot of, lot of training on that. So it's very easy for us to talk with someone on the phone, have them describe the type of foot that they have, mm-hmm. and then translate that into what is the best boot? What is the best foot bed? Um, and it doesn't have to necessarily be custom but uh that's kind of what started it it was yeah. it was a conversation with a dear friend just like you guys putting together a hunt to go out less like we do and and trying you know being a, i'm still a young man but being really wet behind the ears and couldn't afford to really do much of it and thought you know maybe i ought to do it and james and i each threw a few bucks into a pot and started running a business and thought you know what we don't want to be 40 years old and look back and then go, why didn't we do that? Yeah. So your, your listeners there, if they've bought a dream, they need to, I think Steve would agree with that wholeheartedly. Yeah, absolutely. You got, you, you got one shot, man. Yeah. That's awesome. It's cool that you guys have the, you know, the kind of like medical scientific technical background and uh, knowledge of feet and um, you know, all of that comes with that and then that passion for hunting. And it's, it's cool to see that come together in the business. Um, so let's, let's dive right into boots. Um, you know, there's, there's certainly most of our listeners have shopped for boots and probably the vast majority of our listener listeners have realized how difficult that can be. Um, let's start with the boot itself and some, in terms of some terminology, if we can just kind of run through the basics you know, I think of keywords as guys are shopping for boots and hearing things of like, you know, outsole, midsole, shanks, and the upper. Just kind of give us a brief description of the anatomy of a boot, specifically in terms of the boots that we're talking about being, you know, um, hunting, hiking, mountain type boots. What are what's there some of the geometry and uh, terminology to consider? Well, the shank is the is the platform um, in between or above the midsole and the sole uh, creates a lot of the stiffness, the torsional stability in the boot. Uh, the midsole, you think of it as a, sort of a shock absorption feature mm-hmm. um, in that they're made out of different types of uh, materials, urethanes, uh, uh, EVA, uh, and then, of course, the outsole, which is the that piece that um, has the grit to it, the traction. Um, some of those are, are designed to actually cling a little bit better to types of, of surfaces, uh, rocks, uh, you know, even in the industrial section, uh, more of a slip resistant type of thing. Uh, upper obviously is the, the material that wraps around the foot itself. And one of the terms you didn't throw into it, which is really important with boots is the last the last is the model that um, all this is wrapped around. It creates some of the shape of it. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, the rubber rand, which a lot of people see um, on a boot. Rubber rand creates some uh, some additional medial and lateral stability, uh, helps control the foot, kind of helps keep it from sliding off of the shank and the sole and the midsole. Um, but it also does help um protect the 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 leather or the synthetic materials there so Mm -hmm. um well and there and there's something else too you you've got the you know you hear people you hear people talking about these boots constantly so you've got you've got your outsole you've got your midsole then you've got your shank and i'm going to touch on this because it's it's you hear this over and over and over again shanks there's some guys out there that don't like a boot like that. They don't want a full length shank in their boot. They and you're talking feel- then about a full length shank would, uh, shank would be much more stiff. 
it's going to be right. a stiffer and they make them in different thicknesses most of them are made of a nylon material cheaper boots that are made out of more of a compressed fiberboard and then you've got some really hardcore crazy guys out there that just like to wear trail shoes like steve <laughs> <laughs> but i'm gonna say but i'm gonna say something right now <laughs> i'll have to shoot i'll have to shoot a picture of them because i i our weather i don't know what your weather was like mark but around here the rut it we had some cool days but more than not we were dealing with probably 50 degrees to 60 degrees in the evening on our evening hunts and my normal garb was normally a, a Columbia earth tone hooded sweatshirt and a pair of the Solomon speed cross Gore-Tex and olive green shoes. And those shoes had more blood spilt on them this year than anything. They were my lucky shoes. Yeah. And just, oh yeah. Every, everything I was, I was slinging arrows. I was wearing them and that it was working. So yeah tried to wear those as much as possible but yeah they're that that's kind of the shank the, the shank will run that full length and then um hard the hardware of the boot yeah lace to toe feature you know some boots lace a little farther down on the toes some don't mm-hmm. uh, how, how about a higher top boot versus a lower top boot i mean yeah. we, we can sit and talk for absolute hours on the differences of them yeah, that's certainly something we wanted to address too, even, um, you know, height and shanks and stiffness and other factors. Is that really just a factor of the type of terrain that a guy is going to be hunting? I mean, we're, you know, pretty much our listeners are out west for the most part chasing, you know, elk and mule deer, but then we're going to have guys going for goats and things like that. So what are the differences um, that guys might consider um, based on either the species that they are hunting time of year that they're chasing those critters or what sp- you know specific species they're after well i i have to break it down to a per uh, the human or the person that's doing it because everyone's body's different so i i yeah you can you can take uh, excuse me you can take a elk but you can be shooting elk in idaho up in some of the nastiest ruggedest most rugged country you can be in or down in some rolling country in the breaks and those two guys are going to be wearing two totally different boots and and you know i'm sure that your listeners you've got you know a lot of do it yourself for guys but you've got some guys that go on trips that are <laughs> semi-guided where you've got horses packing them out where they don't need a, a full stiff boot but um it really is kind of a personal preference for a lot of guys mm-hmm. i think uh, some people like a little more breathability. Like um, our doctor was in here um, was Thursday. Yeah, I was getting yeah. him fitted up with uh, some he boots that we have, boots, yeah. and um, he was his big concern that he had was uh, his feet got really really hot, perspired, and, and, sw- and he was sweating a lot, and that was one of the big things that he had. So in that uh, case, do you recommend more of a synthetic upper versus a full leather? Blend. A blend. Blend. You know, you're t- the other thing. Well, this stepping back, getting because we kind of got off track here when we were talking about the shanks. And this this comes. It's it's very important. And this is actually something Steve can use in his business as well. It's it it. it what are you carrying? How much weight are you carrying determines a lot of different things. So a lot of times when I'm asking a guy, you know, what's your average pack weight? Mm -hmm. What is your average pack weight? You know, what have your experiences been in this particular boot? Okay. You wore this particular boot on this hunt. You were wearing six, running a 60 or 50 pound pack going in and you just blistered the bottoms of your feet. Well, Odds are, if you had a 50 or 60 pound pack and you blistered the bottom of your feet, there are some medical conditions that could do that. But more than likely, your foot was shifting around inside that boot because you did not have enough torsional stability for your body type. When I come up with, when I envision somebody that's 
just putting a lot of sheer force and torque, I'm thinking of a fullback or a tailback. You know how they're built? Mm-hmm. Big, thick calves, big, stocky build. They just blow blow boots apart. Those guys are putting a lot of lot of sheer force, you know, on the bottoms of their feet. And then you have, you know, some some taller, skinnier guys, but that that do the same thing. But it's just a fat pad displacement that slips around. But to, I think to answer your question, I think selecting the appropriate boot for your application and there is some trial and error that goes along with this but for the most part you know what's your pack way what's your height what's your weight um what do you really intend to use these things be honest with yourself Mm -hmm. be honest with yourself are you going to do it yourself six days five days six days pack in come out a couple days or are you going to go in and you're not going to hire someone to go? I mean, that changes the dynamics of all of your gear, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I I think it does. So for sure. So the, so for those guys who are um, doing it on their own, uh, packing in for, you know, semi extended trips, whether that's, you know, three, five, seven days, what have you. And then, potentially packing things out on their own. Um, you're going to lean them more towards, a, you know, a boot with a stiffer shank that would support the packing out the heavy loads better. Is that accurate? Yeah, I would say yeah. so. Okay. Yeah, for the most part. And then just to throw out, you know, maybe two, three, four recommendations just that might catch guys' ears. Again, not getting specific, but what are some of those boots for that situation I just described that you guys offer? Well, uh, uh, well there's there's several brands. You uh, you're, you're talking about different some of the different models, or are you talking specifically the brand? Because what what is concerning a lot of times, and we hear it, and it can be with any item. Chevy, Ford. I mean, you can go Loa, you can go Scarpa, Scarpa Zamberlin. Uh, but underneath each one of those models, I'm going to sit here and tell you right now, there are the good, the bad, and the ugly. Mm-hmm. <laughs> there are boots, but for the most part, yeah. I mean, the, typically when you get onto Lathrop and Sons and you look at the product that we're selling on the website, they have gone through um, a thorough exam on how they're constructed what their fit is like. Are they going to do what the average Western hunter would be doing? I think that's fair to say. I think it's fair to say. We also kind of take a, a, a step to, for the comfort factor too, yeah. for the type of foot that the individual has. Sure. Sure. And we, I think that's very important. We try not to, I, what, <clears throat> what, what we're getting at is we're, we're trying not to overlap brands. There's no reason to overlap brands. And I guess what I mean by that is if you've got brand X that's doing everything you need it to and it's performing flawlessly, then bringing in another brand to compete against that brand just doesn't make sense for us. Yeah. So how many brands do you carry then? Uh, What do we got right now? Loa. Probably five. Yeah. Got Solomon in there too. Steve likes those. I like them. I've got mine on today. <laughs> yeah, for for me, whatever reason, a Solomon just every boot I've ever had, I just order eleven and a half, and it's good. Like they just fit, no blisters, no issues. So you know that. what? There's something to be said about that when it, when everything works out really good, mm-hmm. uh, you 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 really want to stick with it. I yeah. I know for years I've had a lot of these older folks that that we've taken care of in my dad's podiatry practice. And you'll get one of these little old ladies that calls in or, or asks, can I get something a little different? I want something with a little more color. But these people have got some problems. They're there for a reason. Mm-hmm. Generally, it's pain. Um, it's okay to find something different, but I have, a, I have a hard time wanting to change something up that's already working excellent. Right, so, right. I can see so what I, I get what you're saying, and I, I really, I really like them too. But unfortunately, 
I've got, I've got, I'm going to call them sissy feet. I need to have something underneath the bottom of my, when I put, put on the speed cross as much as I love them, just climbing in and out of deer stands. I, I mean, I, I just, my feet just don't dig the flexing and twisting of it. Maybe I'm just me. Gotcha. Yeah. They fit, good. they fit good though. Mm-hmm. On that point though, of, um, going back to different brands and then, you know, you guys obviously are vetting what you're carrying. And as you mentioned, you're not even carrying everything in the line. Like say Loa, for example, you're only going to carry, um, specific models within that brand that you feel would be a good fit for your customers. But, you know, you take like a couple, you mentioned like a Loa, uh, Zamberlin and a Scarpa, for example. And out of those three, they're, probably going to have a model that are that do compete or compare well with one another right sure sure. at at that point when a user may be deciding between you know a loa zamberlin and a scarpa again it it models that compare to one another what are some of those deciding factors for them like um does a loa tend to foot fit this certain type of foot better versus zamberlin or you know, that's a hypothetical. What are those deciding factors maybe going between brands that might work for guys? Well, I, I think first of all, I would venture to guess that most of the people that are trying to decide on that, they have spoke with one of their friends and they've tried on the boot or so on and so forth. And they'll place an online order, but to, to, to get to it, each one of these brands has a completely different fit. And unless that person contacts us to really sit and speak with us about that in detail, Mm-hmm. and let us listen to what their foot problem is, it's really hard for us to encourage that person to go, well, this, this how about this, Mark? This boot runs this way. These, this is what frustrates everyone in the boot buying community because everyone's online saying, Loa's run wide, Loa's run narrow, <laughs> Scarpa's run this way, Scarpa runs that way. I guess the reality is you let the foot pick the boot. And while we have several people that do our online sales and purchase from us, most people are calling in asking us for that information and trying to pick our brain a little bit on that. I, I mean, I hope that helps a little bit, but for I, what I would hate to do to the audience is to sit there and say, well, the, the, the lower runs wide in the toe box or the scarper runs a two E width in this model. And so it, there's so many variances between those. You, you, you really need to have the person call up and just say, Hey, you know, this is what I've worn in the past. These are the kind of issues that I've had, or I haven't had. I just, I just want to get these boots fitted right. What, what do you think is the right recommendation? So I guess the answer to your question is they all run a little bit different, mm-hmm. and you have to know the guy's foot type to some at some level in order to really give them the right guidance. Yeah. So it is tough, or at least maybe unfair yeah, then to just. It is, and that's a, and that's exactly why there's so many people that that are pulling their hair out these days trying to figure out what which one they want Mm -hmm. a typical guy might that calls us may have already tried three different pairs of boots or four different pairs of boots and they don't give these boots away yeah they're not cheap man i don't have a money tree in my backyard and i know i'm sure you guys don't either most of the listeners out there don't either i wish we did but when you spend two, three hundred dollars on a pair of boots, it's a little discouraging if for some reason it, it bothers you. Well, I don't even think they can get them for two hundred. Well, I'm just stating that's yeah. this just it's can be an aggravation and that's why it is kinda important to yeah. you know, we we feel like we, we know how the, a lot of these boots last it, and the type of feet. I, I guess the, I guess to answer the question if the if the guy can take the time and shoot us an email or call us and let us 
go through it with him. We have our bases covered with the models and the brands that we're carrying. Yeah. So let's let's talk a little bit about that though. That whole uh, the shopping process and then sure. even the trying process. Um, so first things first, whether a guy picks up a boot from you guys and you know gets it shipped because he's called you or chatted online or you know he sure. picks up a boot in a store and he's at home now and you know there's certainly places where you can wear the boot around your house uh you know keep it in like new condition and return it if you have issues what nice. should those guys be doing as they're trying these boots and evaluating yeah. them um, that's, a, good that's question. a fantastic question because we ran into some of that and it's very frustrating too yeah like it's difficult to obviously keep a boot in new condition, not go in the field, and actually determine if it's going to work in the mountains. And that and that's exactly right. I think one of the first things a guy should go ahead and do is put the type of sock that they're wanting to wear on, and stand down on the stock footbed and just look at the overall distance from the end of their toe to the end of their footbed to ensure of one major thing. So you're saying the footbed outside of the boot so they can sure. visually see it. Sure. Yeah. Just to ensure one major thing is that their toe is not too close to the end of the boot. That's that's a safety thing right there. Mm-hmm. Um, we really let people go ahead and, and encourage people uh, to wear things around inside of their house for a little while uh, and make sure that, that everything, if they have a question, they, sh- they should pick up the phone and call us so that we can go over that fit with them before they walk outside. Um, you know, yeah, the other thing that you hear a lot of people complain about is their heels as well. And they need, they need to, what we don't want them to do is to put the boots on and lace them up and throw on their pack and go, cranking up the side up and down the stairs for three hours over a course of 15 days and burn the laces into the tongue and then return them and said we want a size exchange yeah (laughs) that makes it a little tricky but the stair step is a really good indicator on that i know james mentioned the footbed but the stair steppers are really it's just the stair steps in your house is a really good indicator and and if you know they're bare steps throw some cardboard or something try to keep the soles don't rip the tags out lace them up start out low snug it up as you go and the tip that i actually on a taller boot especially have told guys to do is as you work those laces up that leg is to actually in a sitting position in a sitting position rotate that knee forward into the tongue of the boot now Mm -hmm. picture this the tongue of the boot has two pieces of leather that are called a gusset the flap you are you familiar with that right Mm -hmm. okay so if you're lacing that boot up and you get to the top now before you crisscross the laces to tie it push your shin into that boot now, what you're doing is you're opening that gusset up. You ought to be able to slide a couple fingers down in behind the calf of your leg, tie it off, lace it off, and wear it like that. And let me explain to you why I feel that that works. Is It's actually giving that shin a chance to go through some normal range of motion instead of having it cranked up around your calf and your leg in a taller boot and you're binding all that leather up. It just, it, it, I believe that in a taller boot, it speeds up the break-in process and it actually aids in the comfort of the break-in process. I don't know if you guys have ever tried to wear a taller boot to try to uh, break them in. They're not real comfortable to break in. A full leather high cut boot is not real comfortable to break in. Mm-hmm. Have you worn one that hot? You Mark, you wear to the Tibets, don't you? I do. Yep. And I'm talking about like the taller versions, like right, eleven inches or so. Yeah. Yeah. The there's Tibet. definitely. I was. I had some Solomon. Oh, co- comets or cosmic, yeah. and that even those. You know, it's like an eight inch boot. I tried for some late season stuff, and man, that just it rubs on your ankle bones there for a couple, two, three weeks. Hurts like hell. Wads that wads a lot of material up around that ankle, and when you get into these real stiff leather upper 
I mean, they definitely serve their, there's definitely a purpose for that kind of a booth. There's no doubt about that. There's some guys that are really, it's, it's advantageous for them. And, and we typically see those in a custom boot guy that will, will recommend, make a recommendation on that. But, uh, they they take some serious break in man. They, yeah. they, it's not something you buy a month out before a hunt and throw no. on and go. That's an Can't accident that. waiting to happen. So <clears throat> let's let's talk about that because it's certainly something we wanted to hit on. Um, not specifically necessarily about these tall leather boots, but even something like a Tibet or what have you. An average boot, yeah. Yeah, just an average boot. Um, what is the break-in process and procedure? I mean, you know, again, you can get online and read all kinds of things like, you know, guys getting in their shower with them to wet mold them and just, you know, all kinds of stuff. But number one, do most of these boots require break-in? Again, not the super tall ones, but these standard boots. Um, and then what type of timeline would you put on that for most boots? And then are there any specific tips for breaking in boots? I'm going to let James dispel the myth of something for your l- listeners because you guys are here getting the facts from not just boot salesmen, but boot fitters, right? Yeah, that's what we want. Okay, James, you t- dispel the myth of the shower break in or the walk them till they're dry thing. Why is that a bunch of hogwash? Well, because most of them are Gore-Tex line boots, <laughs> and Gore-Tex is a great waterproofing material, so water can't get out. How about so that can't one? Can't really get in. <laughs> kind of makes sense. I can understand it? the outsole or the the upper itself can mold a little bit, but the whole process of it really making it fit like a glove. It, uh, we the, don't light, really the light the light bulb kind of goes on in your head when you hear that, doesn't it? Yeah, mm-hmm. that's just kind of the way we look at. It. O- honest to God, I kind of look at it as this, and I've told several people: if you have gone to a professional place and talked to some professional people that really know how to fit these types of technical boots, um, break-in period can be very little. If you, if you, if you, if you choose the, the, if you help the person choose the correct boot for their foot, and that's really what we try to do here. Mm -hmm. Um, if, if it's done correctly, why wouldn't it fit well? You know what I mean? Right. Um, and and there, there's, there are conditions and, and, and points, you know, Stephen mentioned a tall boot and I totally agree with them. I probably more have worn more taller boots than, than he has. And I can tell you, it's like, uh, when you first put them on, it's like wearing a pneumatic walker. I don't know if anybody knows what a pneumatic walker is out there, but it's one of these types of devices that a physician might put on you. If you've sprained your ankle or, or injured your foot and all that. So it's very, it's very restrictive and it can bite you in the ankles as Steve said. And the, in your shin. But 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 he he touched on the professional getting the boot. That is super important. But what is also important is, and I keep going back to it, and I said it earlier, understanding what the person's doing and really breaking down what they're capable of doing because there's guys out there that are going on a sheep hunt and they've listened to everyone that's going on a sheep hunt. And you know what they all think they need? Alpine crampon compatible boots. Okay. Sure, but that's part of the professionalism part of it too. You take, but, you get the whole picture. But, but, sure but that, that, that I'm going back to <laughs> truly listening to what the listening. customer's doing, listening. but also have combining. And that is, that is, how you achieve a faster break-in period, I feel. Achieving a faster break-in period is setting down with the customer, looking at what kind of a foot they've got, to, or, 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 or in this instance on the telephone, walking them through, listening to what has worked and what hasn't worked, then fit them accordingly, 
And what I think they would expect, and James can correct me if I'm wrong, and, and some of your listeners might, might not believe it, but I would say within three to four weeks of wearing those on the weekends solely with a pack on, increasing your pack weight, if you're going to have a problem, it would have already shown, Sure. and you're good to go. Yeah. I, I feel that way. No, it makes sense. I mean... Obviously, if you have the right boot to begin with, then the break-in process should be ideally minimal. And if, if for some reason past that time period or even further down the road, um, you know, all of a sudden starts to, de- there's a, a problem that does develop, it might actually be that you've already put the boot through its paces or another condition with their foot and it has created some of the issue itself yeah meaning the boot might be losing some of its integrity we've got guides that that the, some of these sheep hunters uh the guides they go through a pair of boots a year oh easy so yeah. <laughs> you, it's it these but, are tough items yeah that's actually uh, uh you know we reached not, out to yeah. some of our followers on instagram to let them know we're gonna be talking with you guys and that's one of the questions we got from one of these guys wanting to know is should he train in his boots doing training hikes and things like that um not not just to break them in but just to train on going and he was was concerned about the longevity basically um you you, you do it you do it because that's the right thing to do you train how you're going to do it does that make sense? Yeah. You, you train as hard as you possibly can so that when you get to that that hunt, you're, you're fine. And the equipment, you need to use that equipment. The equipment eventually will go ahead and break down over a period of time, but that's just part of it. I mean, you got to go ahead and get a new one. You're all so, the die you, on a hunt. That's what you do. Yeah. So how can a guy tell um, that he needs to then replace uh, these boots. I mean, is he just literally waiting for issues to arise and the light bulb to go off and go, these boots used to be more comfortable and now they're not, or I'm having Actually, issues? It, 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 it is. And what, what I think you'll have more times than not happen is you'll actually see a failure with a particular boot as crazy as it happens but you put two three years on a pair of boots thread starts popping on seams they've shoe good stuff together they and and they and they're going on this hunt and they've invested some real money on a hunt or they they drew a tag and then they've got another hand and we'll get the call you know i think these boots got another hunt in them but I don't really want to risk it. What do you think we ought to get this time? I think it's time to replace it. I'll use these around the farm. So I guess when you start seeing things that you think might possibly cause you a problem on the side of the mountain, like breaking a set of laces. I don't know how many of you guys throw paracord or extra laces in your pack. You break your laces on the side of a mountain. That's a bad thing. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, so he's 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 talking about looking at the overall condition, condition of, of the boot. Of the boot. Um, another another way that that uh, we would do it um, is actually setting it right on top of a countertop and squat down and look at the rear foot of it and make sure that the heel isn't twisted one way or the other. Um, many times. Um, you'll actually see that the shank is twisted and, and things determine that based on just the the lower extremity of the individual, if there's a curve to their lower leg or whatever, or, or just the, the material itself breaks down. Oftentimes, and this is something that's kind of interesting, even in athletic foot gear, you can look at it and it doesn't appear to have any uh, twisting or uh curve to it it looks pretty square but the reality is when upon weight bearing and you look at it you'll actually see it ran running over one side or the other so sometimes you kind of have maybe you get up on a chair and let somebody look at you standing on the chair uh just to make sure that there's none of that but just the slightest bit of something being ran over can change how that foot is functioning inside of that boot and create slipping problems 
blistering problems, things like that. That that EVA that he's talking about is in the other way you, to determine it too is you can actually just grab the back of the boot and you can feel both the inside edge of your heel, which would be the medial side so and the lateral, and squishy. feel the durometer, see how squishy. If one feels squishy compared to the other side, you know what that means? It means you're rolling into that and your your body's weight, and you remember the the fullback or tailback guy I was describing? All that pressure rotating into his heel and that boot in the upper of the boot is trying to stop him from doing that. So what he's doing, he's just like a meat tenderizer. He's pounding that material and pounding that material. And what happens is that material becomes softer. It may go back in 24 to 48 hours to its original height, but... If you, uh, upon appearance, it looks square, but when you grab it, it's not. So that that's that's that another, would be that would way. be another way of testing or or evaluating. It. And and obviously, you know, we talked about tears and the rest of that stuff. And and just you know, look the boot over and see. I mean, check and see if the toe box is some is stuff coming unglued. Do I need to send it into these experts and let them perform some hardware well, work my, or what or <clears throat> resoling on them? I mean. When, hey Steve, mm -hmm. what's a what's a telltale sign that a bowstring needs to be replaced? Frame and certain separation. Go. Yeah, yeah, it, it all go. kind of kind of follows suit. You you just gotta kind of pay attention to that stuff. Gotcha. So that that idea of uh, the midsole wearing on one side or the other that's to do with pronation then of the foot. Flat rolling of of the of the heel one way or the other. You'll typically see it in the rear foot. It's harder to see that in a forefoot. We we can, but we know what we're looking for. It would be very difficult for the average guy to do that. Yeah, cool. Well, let's touch on uh, some of the uh, I guess accessories, if you will. Um, you know, one thing you mentioned uh, when we were talking about break-in was uh, wear, or fitting, I should say, was wear the socks that you're going to be wearing. So what are your recommendations and thoughts on socks um, in terms of synthetics versus a merino, in terms of thickness, in terms of liner, no liner, uh, things of that nature? What what have you seen works well for most guys? All right. Everyone has a personal opinion of what socks and I'll be honest with you we used to ask people constantly what kind of socks were you wearing were you interested in you know you're buying this $400 pair of boots what kind of socks believe it or not you guys I go to Costco now, explain to me, unless Costco's actually got some really badass socks, why you would wear a, invest in a $500 tag and a $500 pair of boots and a dozen arrows or what, 100 bucks if you get some good ones and your broadheads. I don't know what solids are costing. but And then go to Costco and buy your socks and blister your feet, right? Mm-hmm. So, going back to the socks, everyone has a different opinion on socks. I personally like, I wear both. But what I'm do gonna, you like? I'm going to be straight up. <laughs> the socks that I wear when I go on my hunt are Bridgedales. I don't tell me, I don't know if it's because... I've got good mojo when I got it's them like on my the feet. shoes. He's got it's Steve. like my shoes. <laughs> but I'm telling you, the it's those Bridgedale socks. Those Bridgedale socks. They call it wool fusion, and they basically blend a new wool merino wool with a poly. They call it uh, wool fusion, and they dry really fast. And I like them because when I'm out in the backcountry, I can, can kick the things off and lay them out in the sun. And you believe it or not, you can shake them. You can get them kind of fluff, puff back up a little bit. I do wear the darn tufts. Today I have a pair of Bridgedales on my feet. But I, but the, 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 uh, 
the darn tough is a merino wool. Uh, it's a little denser, which I like. James likes the really likes the darn tough, and I like the darn tough too. They're a great sock. They actually stay up. I will say this: they stay up. On they your have right a hand. higher higher lycra content in them that stay up. But I, honestly, when I got my boots on and I got my socks pulled up, if they slouch down just a little bit, it, that doesn't really bother me. I my personal feeling is the ability for that wool fusion to dry out in the sun hanging on some oak brush so i've got to carry fewer pairs of socks in my pack as a bonus uh the darn tough sock it's it's definitely a tough sock that it is a dense sock um it's got the lycra that step and the liners i don't personally use a liner knock on wood I have not been plagued with blisters, but I wear our Synergy footbeds. I wear the appropriate socks, and I'm constantly <laughs> evaluating my boots many, 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 many months before I even head out. But I'm telling you right now, we've got customers, if they don't wear the liner socks, it is a made by Bridgedale. It's a Coolmax liner. If they don't use that in combination with either the Darn Tough or the Bridgedale, they will blister their feet, even with our footbed in that. It is a saving grace to them. So is that um, a matter of boot fit, or are there other factors there, such as, you know, the maybe the sensitivity of that person's foot, you know, their skin that they're prone to blister? That are requiring the liner? No, what it is is I think that they have... Could could it could James hit on it? Could be biomechanical, meaning the way that their foot is shifting in the boot, even with the correct boots. And we have to understand, even in a perfect world, nothing's going to be perfect on these guys. So there's nothing symmetrical about our bodies, and these boots are are made to be just alike. You you know, know, so. So that's why you get the guy running into an issue on his left foot, but not his right for, you know. Exactly. We see it all the time. That can even be a leg length inequality, something like that. Well, but but these guys that we've, I've found that are doing these liners, they, they have a lot of excessive perspiration in their feet. That's the first thing. Okay. And there's a condition that's associated with it, and it's called maceration, where the skin gets spongy looking. Right. You know, when your hands or your kids have been in the pool too long, how they look real spongy and white. Pruny and that, yeah. Yeah, their their feet get like that, and they can blister up from that. The other, and the other, that would be a reason to justifiably use a sock system. And I'm going to sit here and say this. Latherpinson started using the terminology sock system, sock system about three or four years ago. No one else was doing it, but it's freaking important. That's why we put all these sock systems together on our website because we had guys that were buying sock A and sock B and said, oh, I just want to try them. They didn't even know how to match these things up, so we tried to kind of help these guys by doing it. But that liner also not only allows perspiration to get away from the skin because but it also it creates a shearing in a shear reducing environment so you've got two planes of these socks working together that's that's the other real uh deal and then i've actually had some guys as crazy as this sounds when they've gone down into uh mexico on some of these really hot hunts they've actually worn just the liners out on an evening hunt they didn't even wear like the light trail socks mhm so <laughs> That's pretty wild. That sounds crazy, but these aren't like pantyhose, not a real thin, thin liner. They're, they're, right. they're, there's a little more to them than that. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Well, that socks. So it's, liners? sorry. Mark, do you wear liners? Um, I've actually gone back and forth. I've found, I don't, if, whether it was conditional or not, or whether it was, you know, I, I used them originally um uh with my tibets and i don't know if it was part of the break-in period where i felt that they helped me um but kind of yeah. since then i i haven't needed to and part of that too is because i'm constantly always experimenting with uh different main socks and so i think aligners worked well with um some socks more as you said as a system versus other socks i can get away with just that sock no liner and and uh not have any issues 
What do you do, Steve? Uh, yeah, no liners. I do, you know, I have certain shoes where certain socks work better than others. Uh, like the XA Pro 3Ds, I need a, a sock with a thicker heel in it just so I seem to get a little bit of lift in the he heel. Um, this year I was using, um, you guys have them on your website, the X Ultra Mids, and I could pretty much slap any sock I have on with that and not have any issues. But well, that's a nice it's funny, it, yeah, it's funny you're talking about like, um, my, my, my feet sweat a lot and it was a problem I had when I first got into really hunting, you know, kind of quote unquote hard when I was about 18, um, my feet would sweat a lot and I was, I, I would, I didn't realize it, but I always had really cold feet. So I started, you know, I just kept adding, I went from a 400 gram thinselet boot to like a 800 gram and my feet just kept getting colder and colder. And now, you know, an uninsulated, you know, these Gore-Tex uh, Solomons, I can hunt in freezing, you know, zero to 10 degree temperatures and my feet stay warm all day, mainly and because really there's ventil ventilation and they're staying dry. Yeah, exactly. that's exactly what it is. And one other thing while we're on that we'll throw out there for some of these guys, it's a fantastic tip, man. Antiperspirant on your feet. Mm. Uh, I've cool. heard of that. I've never tried it. Yeah, that is it. That has been around. We we could grab our father out of the clinic and have him come down here to the headquarters, but we'd we'd be talking about all kinds of stuff that might would. It's not important. Right? Not important. <laughs> but, but but what but what he would be telling you is, you young man. If your feet perspire, you need to be using antiperspirant on those feet be start before you go on the hunt, and you might want to take a little tiny smidge of it with you up there and rub it into the bottom of your feet every other day. And, and it, we get a, used to get a lot of these young young men in here that were in sports and fighting athletes' feet and some other kind of rashes and dermatitis type of stuff, and uh that was it that keep keep the shoes clean and use some some antiperspirant on her feet it, and, and it does it keeps you from getting cold man mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah i just found same too. in the white tail woods too it's a exactly the same in the white tail oh woods. i get my yeah. hands if 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 i take my hands and stick them in my pockets without any gloves on them they can be nice and toasty warm and when I pull them out, if it's really chilly outside, they'll almost instantly start to freeze. But if I go ahead and just keep them fairly uh, uh, cool and exposed somewhat, they're hmm. not getting damp at all. And I can survive a hell of a lot longer. Yeah. So I've noticed that. I just like to wear like a thin wool glove, like a mm -hmm. rag wool style glove, and I can... You know, same thing. Probably with thick, heavy glove, my my hands will sweat, get cold. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and, and a, a wool I, glove, you're getting some breathability there, and your hands are staying dry. My wife bought me a pair of of wool knitted gloves, and I wore these things forever. And they basically kind of screwed me on a deal one time. They, I've I've worn them to the point <clears throat> where the thumb, uh, all the knitting had worn out, and the little piece of felt that kind of helps protect you underneath there is hanging out really bad i was out pistol hunting one day and i had a doe come in i wanted it was late season that's all you could shoot and i really wanted to shoot this deer with my pistol and i remember i lined that baby up i had her dead to rights and i pulled the trigger and that piece of felt got caught between the hammer and the frame of that gun hmm <laughs> It's, it's it's there wasn't a bang. <laughs> there wasn't a bang, and it took me forever to try to get the thing out of there. And she turned and blew, and that was it. <laughs> wow. I've been on a search but trying you, to find another but you, pair. But you know, you know what? You're you're all right about that. And and I and I do a lot. James does too. We do a lot of late season hunting around our food plots and soybeans, and it's usually typically the last three weeks of our season here. It's just brutally cold. You know. 10 to 15 degrees for the highs. And that's kind of the system that I find is I'm using just a, a thin liner glove over rag wool uh, fingerless with the mitten flaps that flip mm -hmm. over it. And, you know, I my bow hands, my mitten basically, sure. and my, re my release is that. Because when it gets that cold, you can't really stand having your hands out not very long yeah 
<laughs> cool. Well, while we have a, a little bit of time, I want to hit on just a few more things if we can, because sure. we have some questions about it, and if we don't cover it, I know, I know we'll get them. One is um, on leather boots in terms of um, boot care, boot conditioning. Are there any certain types of products that you guys recommend for that? Well, we, we recommend the Granger for the leather. Uh, it's a, a paste wax. Um, and it's recommended by Gore-Tex, which is one of the reasons. And it also will help um, that product will kind of help keep the rubber rands from um, coming loose. Okay. Um, it's like a cream. It works really well. And then the, the, the uh, uh, boots that have a little leather and, and the, the synthetic upper, we like the uh, uh, repel made by Granger as well. Yeah, it's a water. Ba- it's actually the footwear repel is more of a water, water-based spray. It almost looks like a watered down, the kind of Glue. skim, <laughs> now, almost like skim milk is what it yeah, looks like. Yeah. And you know what's really cool about this? And I treated my boots before we went for Colorado this year. I don't remember what we had done. I got them really, really filthy, muddy from all of that training in March and I was rinsing all these boot getting the mud off them just kind of cleaning them up you know and I didn't want to set them out in direct sunlight to dry them out that's something else we need to touch on real quick and then um, their concept is to, when the boots are slightly damp is to apply this water-based wax to them Mm. And you would be surprised when those completely dry out. You can run your hand over that wa- that leather, and it actually feels like it has a coating of wax on it, but it doesn't even look like it. It's the craziest stuff you've ever seen. Hmm. And, and the fabric, the water will run right off of it. It'll run, run right off of it. It'll, it, it, just, it, it just doesn't do it. The, the um, paste wax that he was talking about, They've actually, I forget what they told me, they mixed in with it to whip that Granger paste wax up to give it a creamier substance so it's not just putting hardcore beeswax on it. It's actually conditioning the leather. Yeah. So yeah, no, you got to be careful. There's some of these, some of these products have got w- w- too much petroleum in them. And it will actually cause when it gets heated in, when they heat it in, it will cause that rand, the rubber, the lip on the rubber to delaminate the glue Mm. that's holding your rand down. So be very, very cautious on um, putting, putting some of those toxic products. You know, a lot of these, these conditioners were built for, stitched down leather constructed boots right okay all right so it's something that we've mentioned as well we definitely need to address is uh footbeds or insoles um i mean i don't want to make this a commercial but at the same time i will say this about three years ago i tried a ton of insoles everything from stock insoles my tibets to super feet and all kinds of things and was not happy with anything until I tried um, the insoles that you guys have developed and offered. So kind of personally, um, what was behind that insole, the product that you guys came up with? Um, how did that come together? Because I, I mean, honestly, I've been using it for years and it's phenomenal. Well, it started in the, it started in the podiatry arena and orthotic arena. Gosh, that's where it all started. 20 or 30, 30 years ago, they started using the concept of a soft, you know, type of polymer insole and to help with plantar sores or ulcerations, which is nothing more than a deep blister, basically, on someone that has a numb foot. And, you know, over the years working in this office and filling prescriptions for, for doctors for different foot gear and foot baths, <laughs> one prescription we kept seeing was soft accommodative orthotic with a orthopedic shoe. And we would use this polymer with a different type of covering on it and fit it. And these people would heal up and stayed healed for the most part. So, Later down the road, we developed like a generate, I'll call it generation one. 
Then we had Generation 2, and we're currently on Generation 3. And what we basically have done is taken that same polymer that is poured at a a, a firmness that can, that can be varied for our custom boot guys, um, and the covers can be changed for them as well. And then we have our standard, but it's kind of the middle of the road, closest to the fat pad and the human foot. And then we've dimpled it in specific areas to create more total contact and more moldability. Um, and it's got some heel height to the insert where all of them want to create more arch support and throw you into these different positions in this boot. Well, grab the boot and try to twist it. Mark, you can't twist a Tibet left and right very easy. That's can't pretty sure. It. Yeah. Okay. Not- so, so, so we always kind of laugh, you know, guys, we made our living making custom fabricated orthotics. Um, we wouldn't be sitting there. We're not bashing orthotics, but I'm telling you, putting an orthotic into a rigid mountaineering boot like that, you can actually screw somebody up because it overcorrects that foot. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right. I got to I got to add this in. We just I just got home at 2 a.m. last night from a, a blacktail hunt with uh, Cody Callum. I think you guys know Cody from the Fold Rough Home Tour. Yes. Uh, and he had a, a custom orthotic made for his running shoes and decided to slap them into his hunting boots. And on the five mile hike in, it was like your the ad. You guys, uh, I don't know if you still run it, but I remember seeing the picture where silver dollar yeah, size blisters. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it was it was it was almost comical because it was within a five mile well, hike. That's not very funny, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> I was laughing. Did, did, he wasn't. <laughs> oh, I'm sure you were. I, did you say, "Hey, I know the guys you can call about that"? I, know, I, I told him we were doing this podcast, and so I was definitely going to have to bring it up because it was it was crazy. But you know, if you looked at the orthotic, we took it out of the shoe. It's only like probably on eighth an inch thicker at the heel, but that was enough to maybe lift the heel out of the heel cup and then it was just moving up and down and it just it happened pretty quick and right. on a five mile hike and and he was right. scorched luckily he had all sorts of kt tape and blister stuff that he was able to get through the hunt but it's definitely not something you want to just slap in and go do that's a perfect example of what i was talking about of overcorrection of overcorrection if you don't have that functional orthotic sitting in your hands with that boot Nine times out of ten, the shell of that orthotic is not going to fit into that boot. And what happens is if the shell is not fitting flat in the boot the way that it should, and I'm telling you from hand grinding and fitting these, it's an in and out of the boot process probably close to ten times just to get that hard shell to fit down in it. Wow. Once you get it down in there, then you're pretty safe. But if you don't, what happens, you invert that insert, which means you're inverting your heel and you're grinding it into the back of the heel counter. It didn't have anything to do with the heel height that had to do it. It had him inverted or overcorrected. And these, well, most of these people that are prescribing these orthotics sent them out to a lab to have these orthotics. That's the one thing that my father never did. We made them right here well, in the house, but too. But it, it even goes a step further. Most people that are making a custom orthotic as a physician, they're putting these patients into a boot that's not as rigid as these mountaineering types of boots. And so it's okay to wear them in there. You're not overcorrecting the foot. That's why they work in those types of environments. Gotcha. Sure. I mean, if he was that's wearing exactly a pair right. of Red Wing work boots <clears throat> or a pair of the con- boots or New Balance the, Cascadia the, or running shoe, he'd been fine. The concept of being overcorrected is having somewhat of a rigid device that normally would prevent, we'll say, pronation, which is everybody's used to. Um, now, the boots are already controlling a lot of that pronation. You go ahead and put something in there that's doubling up on that. Now you're literally causing the foot to not go through the normal ron- the normal amount of pronation that it needs to go through to be able to function. Hmm. Which is why our footbed works. Yeah. Yeah. The foot it's actually easy. does need to go through some range of pronation. That's part of the normal it's gait to cycle. Propel, propel off the foot. But, Most but, people don't but, that, but that the biggest thing to touch on with the, the footbed is it was many, 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 many years. It was my father, Dr. Lather, myself, and James and working with a kick-ass engineering team that really 
have the same kind of passions that we had. The actual owner of the company, Mike Zacharias, he is an absolute bow hunting machine. And we just, we fell into it with him. I mean, he's like, I'm on board. Let's get this made. And we just, we had the guys we needed to get this thing fabricated the best. I, I don't think there's a group out there that, I mean, these guys were just top notch. And to have something in common, just like our customers calling us, it was the same when we designed all of our molds and, and rapid prototypes and all that stuff. So we, we were really fortunate in that sense. And uh, it was a long time coming, but it, it's a definitely a, it's a, it's a deal breaker for most guys. I mean, guys, take, did you take a poll. What's, what's the leading cause of a person ending this hunt? His feet, blisters, you're done. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for he sure. Take, take them up. That's it. Yeah. So if you design a footbed that is 90, I won't say 90%, if 50% of that insert's design is there to stop shearing on the skin and it's going to stop blistering, then hell, you got it, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. No, I mean, I like I said, I tried, and this was, you know, before I knew you guys and anything, but I was pissed because I tried like four or five other things, and even oh, insoles yeah. aren't cheap, much less the boots. But, um, oh. yeah, they're they're they've been great for me anyway. That's all I can say. Well, well, I I we appreciate it, and I'm glad to hear that you, we actually do have guys that'll. Gosh, they'll send in four or five pairs of boots and have us fit them to their boots for them. They don't want to screw them up, and and you know we we offer that service for them, and you know that that's a great service because it. it I guess it's this: if you're buying the boots and you buy the footbeds, if you pay us to grind it and fit it by hand to allow for the right expansion, and then you find out that hey, I was a half size off, then that guy can always send the boots back with that footbed. He hasn't sold the footbed. He simply tried to footbed on. We just make the size exchange, and now we simply grind another foot. But that way, he's not guessing and cutting and hacking the thing apart. Yeah. So on that note, that's kind of the last thing I want to touch on is your custom fitting services. I mean, even if you go to uh, your site and go to look at a boot and begin the checkout process, you can see that that is an add-on, is a custom yep. fitting for a boot. So what does that involve? That you know, if a guy's in, you know, Idaho, uh, how's he going to get his boot custom fitted through you guys? So, so basically what he's getting done is that $35 fee that he is paying is for myself or James or one of our technicians to take that footbed to grind it specifically from a pattern of that boot that he purchased and it will be cut, then it's ground, then it's trimmed up because you'll have fuzz around it from the nylon. It's trimmed up and then it's heat melted. It will go in and out of that boot a couple times. And what we're trying to do is to allow just enough expansion of that polymer to where when you come down and load on it, and Mark, I'm sure you've seen it with yours, when you push on it, it squeezes out, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. So if you don't allow that expansion out there, it's going to bump and start crawling up in the toe box. Yep. So what we're really doing is we're custom fitting the boot. Yes, the boot becomes a custom fitted boot, but that $35 charge is a custom fitting. And what I was discussing a second ago is the guy in Idaho that's buying a pair of boots from Jane, <coughs> excuse me, or myself, that's teeter-tottering between the size 10 and the 10 and a half. And he says, you know what? Just send me the 10 and a half. I mean, after they talk for 20 minutes, they send the 10 and a half. He listens to James or myself explain the importance of having the footbed fitted right. He says, you know what? Just, just custom fit. It's 35 bucks. I want it done right. What he just did for himself was gave himself the opportunity to do what we originally started in this conversation was replicating the use of the product the way you would in the mountains, right? Mm -hmm. So he can put his mid-weight socks on. He can lace his boots up with 
foot bat in if the boot does not fit he can pick the phone up and say can i talk to you about my fit absolutely what's going on i feel a little of this i feel this you know what shoot a picture of it for me email it to me boom yep you're off an eighth you're you're off a half size what do i need to do Send the boots back, throw the footbeds back into the box. As soon as we get them, we'll make the size exchange. We'll go ahead and custom fit another pair of footbeds for that. It's buying, it's kind of an insurance policy that he's going to have it right eventually. Yeah. Very nice. Awesome. You, you do something where you, you send the customer something that they step on? Or? That, yes, we do. That is the custom boot system. And what that is, is you got a guy that doesn't have a clue what he's doing, doesn't or has does have a clue what he's doing, but he's been in misery on all these hunts. He's sick of it. He's not doing it anymore. He barely made it off this on this last hunt. Oh, we've experienced this this year already. Guys coming off of the side of a mountain and said, I won't experience what I just went through again. I'm getting some boots that fit my damn feet. What do we need to do? And we'll tell them, you need to buy a mapping kit. And it's a carbon imprint that they step on. And basically, it looks like an imprint in sand, full weight bearing. Why? Because that's the position your foot's going to be in with the, in the inside that boot. There's nothing going to be corrected. There's no arch in there. We're not overcorrecting the foot. We want to see the elongation. We want to see what your arch is doing. And what that carbon does is it shows the pressure. And we run it through our little formula to determine this formula, by the way, has taken us probably close to 15, 16 years to get it to dialed into the point where we take some measurements. And what we're able to do is to determine exactly what last or boot is correct for that person's foot, what the length is, what the width is, where he it's, what the allowances are that we need. And then we call and we set a consultation up and we actually spend about 45 minutes with this guy on the phone and we go through figuring out what worked in the past, what didn't work in the past, it set multitude of questions and answers to come up with, this is our recommendation for you based on your foot, your height, your weight, your pack weight, and what you're planning on doing 80% of the time, this is the boot, and these are the couple models that we would recommend, and I don't care what your size is, but your tracings are telling us this is a size you should be in, and this is the kind of footbed that we're going to develop for you, and this is the type of cover that we're going to do, and there are some modifications included, for some of these guys, we have to heat mold like a custom ski boot the front of the boot or the back of the heel or narrow up the toe box or widen up, the, excuse me, narrow the, the heel counter down or widen up the toe box. That is all part of the custom boot system. And that and that really is a personalized service. So if, if you've ever heard of people having a custom ski boot fit to their foot, that's essentially what we're doing for these guys. And some guys really do have a serious problem. Guys, we actually had something that is really, really impressive. And we should probably allow somebody like you to, to really help us get the word out. We had a gentleman that survived cancer twice. He got his name drawn for a lifetime hunt, raffle hunt, for a doll sheep hunt. Oh, the guy wow. drove three hours. The chemotherapy that he went through burned all the nerves up in his lower extremities. So he can't feel his feet. He's missing half of his foot. He has what they call a transmetatarsal amputation. He came in and he consulted. What, what was he, four hours north of us about? Three and a half, something yes. like that? He had gone into a, a very high-end sporting goods store where he gets all of his hunting ammo and guns and that and they said you need to go see these guys we went through the evaluation we did a custom boot system for this guy through a prescription obviously dr lathrop looked at this yes this system. wasn't something that we just took on ourselves no. we literally build him a prosthetic orthotic with the front of his foot 
fit it to a pair of boots, made the modifications, and he went up and he killed his doll's sheep. Oh, that's awesome. Is that freaking <laughs> awesome? Yeah. The that's guy's awesome. like, what is he, like 65 maybe? I don't know. He's a character. Though. He's a great guy, man. Wow. It felt good. Yeah, that's but too cool. Man. This custom, it, it's cool. The, the the but the custom boot systems again. It, it's 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 we we get the average guy that's just completely frustrated and doesn't just want to buy a pair of boots. He wants to go all in and he wants to have you know he wants his footbed generated a different way. So yeah, yeah. Well, I'm sure there's I I know there's more questions that I can even ask, but we're pretty much out of time. So I'm sure there's other questions that listeners have. Um, I know that you guys love to help. And so what's the best way if guys are shopping for boots and have questions that they should contact you about that? Well, they can contact us on the, on the internet through our email at boots at Lathrop or they can pick up the phone and call us at uh, area code 618-544-544. 8782. They're either going to speak to myself, James, or my brother, Stephen. Um, that's that's the best way to, to contact us. All right. Yeah, we're, good about, we're, we're really good about that. And I think that's what really truly sets us apart from. Of course, we like to deer hunt a little bit too. And it is deer hunting season. <laughs> it's a good thing you threw the caveat out there in case they don't. Answer the phone right away, right? <laughs> yeah, just leave we have, a, we have an answering machine. <laughs> we do and, have an answering machine. We, but now, no, that's that's the best, and that's that's what's nice about what we're doing here is we're able to set it up to where you know the guy can call in and not feel like he's just talking to somebody that's trying to sell him a pair of boots. We're going to fit him. I mean, it doesn't matter whether it's a custom boot system. Or if it's a guy just want that can just afford to buy a pair of boots and he'll have to get the footbeds later, he's still he's still, he's still get a customer. To to he's still gonna us. get somebody to help him. Yeah, that's honestly, man, that's what's missing out there. Yeah, no, I agree. Yeah. Well, fellas, it's been great. What's that uh, discount code that's gonna run through the thirtieth? What is that one more time? No, it's gobble fifteen. Gobble fifteen. Gobble one five. Okay. Well, Steve, James, thank you so much. That was an uh, excellent yeah, ton of information. Thank you, man. Thanks for having us on. We really appreciate it. Thanks for listening, guys. Be sure and send us your feedback by leaving us a review or shoot us an email to podcast at exomountaingear.com. 